Okay. So hopefully everybody can hear me and hopefully everybody can see what's on the screen. Yeah, all good. Okay, so so this is uh this is number three in a series that we've been looking at the throne of David. So uh, obviously I won't probably go back over the whole thing. Um, and um, I'm not really gonna do that much speaking this evening actually, because I've got a video from uh, Steve Gillespie that I think is very good, that gives a bit of a summary over the whole thing. Um, but what we, did, what we did look at, maybe just to recap, if I just go into the, the Fares line here, just for one sec. So here is the royal lines from Zara and Fares of Judah. So obviously, just to give a bit of a, a brief recap, in, in the Old Testament, we've looked at it in previous weeks, that the Lord had made a number of promises through Abraham and in particular to King David, that there would always be somebody on the throne of David until Jesus Christ returns. And in the Old Testament, in Genesis, there's this story of Tamar, who has twins. One's called Zara, who puts his hand out first to come out. And the midwife puts a, a red band or something, something red around his hand. And instead, the second twin comes out, whose name is Fares. And most of us would be familiar with the Fares line because that's where King David, Solomon, all the way down to Zedekiah, who's the last king of Judah before he gets killed in Babylon. But way, way back in the, in, in the book of Genesis, the Zara line, which is kind of operating outside of um, scripture in the sense that we don't have much scripture on it we see we see what Zara's sons were called and we've looked at some of the circular history and we've looked at some of the traditions how the Zara line came into Ireland before the before the Fares line so the high king in Ireland way back in the day used to have kings or a monarchy, very much like uh, Britain does today. And the high king of Ireland at the time had come from this Zara line, uh, traveling through uh, uh, Greece and into Spain, through Mila Spain or the Miletians. When they come in, you can look at the Irish annals, how they come into, into, into Ireland or the Isles of the West. And... Um, then we looked at last week in particular how the prophet Jeremiah, when, when Judah had fallen, that in the Old Testament, that the monarchy line could pass into the female. And we looked at a couple of the prophecies about the tender twig being removed, removed or moved into the appointed place, which happened to be Ireland. And the daughter was called Tamar. She marries the High King of Ireland, and for a thousand years, the kings of Ireland are uh, uh, carrying on this, this prophecy, carrying on this throne of David. And that's where we left it. So we've seen the marriage of the Zara line with the Faraz line, and how the Zara line then became the preeminence or the high part of the three as it says in Ezekiel, and uh, the Pharaoh's line took the, the lesser, the lesser um, preeminence, if you like. Uh, there's a number of different prophecies, of course, around it, various different things. I'm just going to read in, uh, in Ezekiel. You can go there if you want, but I'm going to read it out anyway. In Ezekiel 21 and in verse 26 to 27, it says, Thus saith the Lord God, Remove the diadem, which is really the, the crown, and take off the crown and shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low, the Zara, and abase him that is high, which was the, the Pharaoh's line. And thus, and I will overturn, overturn 
overturn it, and it shall be no more until he whose right it is, and I will give it to him. So he's saying that the crown or the throne of David was going to be moved three times. Once from the Middle East to Ireland, the next time was going to move from Ireland to Scotland, and then eventually to England, where it will stay until Jesus Christ returns. So that's that's where we're at, catching up on the last two sessions. Very quick summary. Now I'm uh, going to just bring myself in here for a sec. So where I want to go to tonight is not there. That's going backwards. Uh, just let me escape out that for a sec. Um, I want to go home. I want to present. And we're going to look a bit, not too much, because I, I really got to pass it over to the video, which will which will summarize the whole thing. So here's, here's a little uh, caption. So up to now, we, we've brought in the, the Zara, the Fares line and uh, the prophet Jeremiah and the prophecies that come with that and the fact that it would be overturned three times and the fact how the Lord would use the tender twig, which symbolized the female side of things on the, on the, on the family of the monarchy in moving that to Ireland. And here's just a couple of dates. I wouldn't say that these are, you know, there's a bit of, there'll always be debate about dates. Um, just as I'm reading this, uh, the line of Jacob's pillar. So some of us are familiar with what's called the Stone of Scone, which is currently in uh, Edinburgh Castle. You can go and you can look at it. Most people don't. They tend to look at all the other fancy stuff around. But the, the Stone of Scone is, is reputed to be Jacob's pillar. And probably the 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 most valuable, um, if you like, uh, kind of archaeological, um, uh, what would you call it? Like uh, item, <laughs> for want of a better word, probably in the British Isles, and it's it's almost like the stone that's rejected, as the scriptures talk about. People don't really in the world pay too much heed to this. But next year, when King Charles eventually becomes king, if he if he lasts and the Lord hasn't returned, uh, that stone will come down from Scotland and will be put into a particular chair and a whole uh, coronation will take place that's very, very uh, similar or on the lines of how they did it in the Old Testament. And we might just quickly look at a couple of scriptures. I, again, I can read them out. In Genesis chapter 28. Um, and 28 and in verse 18. So this is Jacob. This is going way back, back into Genesis. And most of us might be familiar about uh, Jacob's dream. And what happens is, is he, it says he rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillow and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. So this may be the rock or the pillar that's referring to here in uh, Jacob's dream, that that rock or that pillar is reputed to be the pillar or Jacob's pillar or the stone of scone or what the Irish call the Lee of Fail uh, that was used when the coronation of a new king or a queen took place. And that, that is reputed to go all the way back uh, to this uh, moment when Jacob uh, anointed it and said that this is surely the Lord's house as you, you read on. It's interesting in Genesis 49 and in verse 24, the whole chapter is talking about what would become of the tribes of Israel and, and the characteristics of them. And we know that uh, the throne of David 
when we looked at Zara and Pharez, they're both from the tribe of Judah. And the interesting thing is, is, is England from a prophetical point of view is mainly Ephraim or Joseph. We, we talk about it without going into the whole, I don't have time to go into that, but some of us are familiar with the fact when you look at Bible prophecy, we might look at that another day, how Joseph's descendants, his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, that we believe became uh, Britain, mainly England, and, and America became Manasseh. And there's an interesting little scripture because you think about the throne of David, which is from Judah, is actually currently in England with Ephraim or with Joseph. And this scripture makes a little bit more sense when you read it. It says in verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. Uh, he's, he's, he's been um, quite militaristic throughout our history across Britain and not always favourable in some quarters, but regardless that it is a fact to, that he's, He's, he's been fruitful and he's, he's spread over. How did that little island uh, become uh, uh, one of the biggest empires in the world, if not the biggest empire in the world? It says the archers have sorely grieved him and shot him and hated him. And this is the interesting part. So we know that he's, that if you look at the whole British monarchy, it says uh, evil to him that think it evil. And uh, there's a whole, there's a whole, uh, a lot that we could go into, but just park on that for a second. But well, his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From hence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. And it's just interesting that he uses that language because they are effectively are the shepherds of the throne of David. So so although it's it although when you look at it, uh, Prince Charles is from the tribe of Judah. The the majority of the country that he lives in is Joseph, who's the shepherd and protects that throne, um, over the Commonwealth. And uh, it's just a very interesting scripture when you when you look at it in that context. Uh, just one other scripture in in Second Kings. Again, no need to go there. And just one little verse here. And, and, and this is this particular passage of scripture is, is kind of repeated uh, throughout uh, a lot of the kings uh, um, in the Old Testament when they were being gone through the coronation. So the coronation of a particular king called Josiah, it says in verse three of of chapter 23 and the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the lord to walk after the lord and to keep his commandments and his testimony and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul so to perform the words of this covenant that were written in the book and all the people stood to the covenant and it goes on to talk about that the people would say god saved the king and it's it's again it's it's just interesting that this is the template that is used over and over again. Would have been used when the throne was transferred with that stone, by the way. When Tamar came with Jer Jeremiah, married a high king, Okad, in Ireland, and they would have gone through that ceremony. And for a thousand years between um, 583, BC and 500 AD, if you do the maths, that's 1083. That it's actually the longest uh, where the where where it sat in the in the British Isles actually was in Ireland, and eventually it moved to Scotland with Fergus. He took the stone, and again that was the second overturn of the throne moving from Ireland to Scotland. And eventually then Edward I, the hammer of the Scots, I believe, he eventually takes the, the stone to England. It did come back in the 1960s, I think it was, 
back to Scotland as an agreement uh, or a, a bit of a compromise from the English that they would say that allowed the stone to stay in Edinburgh Castle, as I, I said earlier, and that when a new monarch came onto the throne, that that stone would go down as part of the coronation. So this is just a couple of dates. And, and again, it's just another piece of the puzzle or the prophecy coming on top of the other ones that we've looked at recently. So now just to, to speed it up, because I want to go to that video. Um, this is currently in the Hill of Tara outside of, just outside of Dublin. There's a replica stone, which is called the Lee of Fair, or the Stone of Destiny. Uh, that's just the replica. Uh, as I said, the stone eventually went up to Scotland. Uh, it's reputed maybe that the Ark is also bur buried at the Hill of Tara. Nobody knows for sure. And when the Lord returns, I'm sure he'll uh, reveal all. On the left-hand side is, is when David was on the throne, the Lord had promised quite amazingly, and David was astonished, uh, that he was promised there would always be somebody on the throne of David, regardless of the behavior. It wasn't conditional on, on the behavior of the kings or the monarchy and the family. It was just a fact that God had promised he was going to keep somebody from the line of Judah through David on that throne till Shiloh comes, who's Jesus Christ. When he comes at his second coming, he will be the king of kings. And this is just a depiction of the various different types of people that came into the appointed place or the mountain of the high height of Israel. And that God said it would be the Isles of the West where they would move to and of course currently down here is where is where this particular seat is positioned in in westminster abbey i believe and you see the stone so when king charles comes next week or next not next week next year that's where he'll sit and that whole coronation that's uh been going on uh, in the old testament ever since the lord allowed Israel take a monarchy uh, from uh, Saul onto King David onto Solomon and so on, all the way to the kings of Ireland, Scotland, and currently in England. So that's just a bit of a, a recap on the stone. Just wanted to make the point, you know, it's interesting that the Scots, they, I remember staying in a B&B &B, um, a few years back, a few years now, and uh, they had a, a, the declaration of our vote, which was back in the 1200s or 1300s for uh, Edward de Bruce, and how he was saying that the Scots were really uh, descended from a people called the Scythians, or possibly where the name Scott comes from, uh, uh, and that they'd traveled through Hercules pillars or or, or, or Gibraltar, as it's known as. And, and as, as we'd seen in previous weeks, that tended to be, if you were using the sea from the Middle East, where Israelite people migrated past Greece, around by Spain, up to North Spain and over into the British Isles. And the Scots uh, say that they were a, a particular people that came through and that they, they are descended from people that had come from there. So they were just, when you look at it, you can see, I'm not gonna look at it in any great detail tonight, but if you've, looking at, if you've looked at the recent um, Friday night knowledge-based talks that we did, we did one on Parthia not too long ago. Well, the Scythians were just up above the Parthians. And that's where uh, a lot of the Israelites had migrated to when the Assyrians uh, came and took the house of Israel back in 721 BC. So not, without going into all of that, it's just the, the point that the Scots, as well as the Irish history, also show where they came from. They weren't native Indian people. They traveled from the Middle East and very much on the same migration route as a lot of the other people that came to the British Isles. So without further ado, 
what we're going to do now, here's, here's uh, we'll, we'll look at this again as just a recap. This was where we started the breach between when the two, uh, when the twins came out, the Zara line and the Faraz line, how the Faraz line came to Zedekiah. Jeremiah takes the daughter to Ireland and transplants the throne and how Zara had already migrated into Ireland. And this great marriage takes place, a healing of the, the breach, if you like, that's what the word Faraz means, breach. Um, and that the throne of David continues. It's overturned the second time to Scotland and then the third time to, to England. And obviously at the time this was done, Queen Elizabeth was still on the throne and obviously that's changed in recent weeks. So we, we might have a quick look at just some of the symbolism in the coronation if we have time. But I'm going to play this video, which will kind of summarise and bring everything together that we've looked at in the past uh, three or four weeks. OK, so I'm just going to make sure I can see you all just for a second so that you I know you can hear this. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear this. OK. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. On the 8th of September 2022, Queen Elizabeth II passed away at the age of 96, ending a reign of 70 years, 214 days, the longest reign of any British monarch and the world's second longest sovereign reign of all time. Despite criticism from some quarters, she continued to maintain an incredible sense of duty commanding global admiration and respect throughout her reign and during some of the most challenging times in modern history, not least of all during the transition from the post-World War II sunset of the British Empire to become honorary head of 54 Commonwealth nations, with all proceedings largely conducted in relative peace. Many news agencies around the globe reported her death as marking the end of an era. Whilst no doubt this did indeed mark the end of an era, it is not the end of the British throne. And the reason why it is not the end is that the British throne and the continuation of that throne is ordained by the Almighty God of the Bible. God made certain covenant promises to the descendants of King David of all Israel, and despite the efforts of the enemies of God's word and all attempts to prove God wrong and his promises a failure, these promises are set to continue regardless of human conditions, fallibility and failures. Furthermore, these promises will prevail until the personal return of Jesus Christ whereupon he will occupy the throne God established as the ultimate monarch, the true king of kings and eternal saviour of mankind. In this presentation, we concentrate on the covenant made by God concerning King David, his descendants and his representative earthly throne and verify the continued validity of that covenant today. Firstly, we know that the God of the Bible is a God of covenants. A covenant is a contractual agreement. The word covenant comes from the Latin convenia, meaning a coming together. It presupposes two or more parties who come together to make a binding contract, agreeing on certain promises, stipulations, privileges and responsibilities. There are at least seven major covenants in the Bible. The Edenic Covenant. God made a covenant in the Garden of Eden concerning simple obedience to his commands. 
the post-Edenic covenant. Immediately after Adam and Eve's fall from grace, God promised a saviour and a redeemer to reconcile the breach of contract by man. The Noahic covenant. This is the promise of a new heaven and earth for the descendants of Noah. The Abrahamic covenant. This comprises a set of promises ordained by God upon the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the latter who was renamed Israel. The Mosaic or Old Covenant, the marriage contract between God and Israel embodied in the Old Testament law of ordinances. The Davidic Covenant, the promise to establish and maintain a perpetual dynasty out of which Christ would be born. And the New Covenant, the promise of salvation and ultimate restoration under the Redeemer, Jesus Christ. An Eighth Covenant is likely to be established during the coming millennial reign of Christ. The two covenants of particular significance in this instance are the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants. Firstly, we look at the Abrahamic covenant. We start with God calling Abraham as recorded in Genesis 12. His name was changed to Abraham in Genesis 17. God declared that in Abraham's son Isaac, his seed would be called in Genesis 21 verse 12. Isaac's wife Rebekah had twin sons, Esau and Jacob, as recorded in Genesis 25. Esau sold his birthright and was disinherited as recorded in Genesis chapters 25 and 27. Jacob received the birthright blessings and God changed his name to Israel, meaning to rule with God, in Genesis 32. Israel had twelve sons, with Judah and Joseph being nominated for special future roles, in Genesis 37 and 49. Judah was to be the progenitor of a royal dynasty, as specified in Genesis 49, verses 8 to 12. And Joseph was to perpetuate the birthright, as specified in Genesis 37 and 49. Both lineages being mentioned in 1 Chronicles 5, verses 1 to 2. Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt by his brothers. But God blessed him, and he had twin sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, recorded in Genesis 48. In the latter days, that is the New Testament era, these would develop into a company of nations and a great people, as prophesied in Genesis 35 verse 11 and Genesis 48 verses 15 to 20. These promises have been fulfilled in the United Kingdom of Great Britain, the Commonwealth and the United States of America as the 13th tribe. We now focus on the line of the Patriarch Judah and the Royal Scepter dynasty as promised by God. Judah had twin sons, Zara and Phares, as recorded in Genesis 38. David came from the Pharaoh's line and was anointed as king over all Israel, as recorded in 2 Samuel 2, verse 4. 2 Samuel 7, verses 8 through to 17, records God's promise to set up a perpetual throne to be occupied by the descendants of David. The earthly throne was to rule over the house of Jacob Israel forever principally over Ephraim as the leading tribe of Israel. God also promised that the Messiah would come through the seed of David, fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Genesis 49 verse 10 and Jeremiah 33 verse 17 confirm that the earthly throne will continue to be occupied by a representative of the seed of David until Christ the Messiah comes to take up that throne forever. Luke 1 verses 32 to 33 confirms that Christ will ultimately sit on that throne, ruling over the house of Jacob 
and inaugurating his everlasting kingdom. We now focus further on the development of the two lines of the Judah family, to whom were given God's promises regarding the royal dynasty via Jacob Israel. The patriarch Judah's twin sons, Zara and Phares, were born via his widowed daughter-in-law, Tamar. At the birth, Zara's hand emerged first and the midwife bound a scarlet thread upon it to signify the right of the firstborn. The symbol of the red hand in heraldry prevails to this day. Nevertheless, as Zara drew back his hand, his twin brother Phares came out, hence he was named Phares, meaning breach. The Phares line gained the principal royal ascendancy in the Promised Land, with the lineage passing through David and Solomon, eventually through to King Zedekiah's daughter, as the last of the Phares line. The Zara Judah line developed independently via migrations westward, notably via Cretan and Milesian kings, of whom the Heremon or High King of Ireland is descended. Zedekiah's daughter was taken to Ireland via Spain, accompanied by Jeremiah, where she was subsequently married to the Heremon of Ireland, uniting the Fares and Zara lines, and thus the original breach was repaired. The twin lines of Judah had merged through this union, and now the Zara line began to fulfil its destiny as the firstborn, in union with the twin line of Fares. The ensuing Irish kings developed into Scottish kings and from thence to English kings and finally to all kings of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, emerging as the world's most enduring throne. Now follows the supreme climax of the ancient ritual. With St Edward's son, the crown of England, the Archbishop performs the simple, yet the most significant ceremony of the Queen's coronation. God described his covenant with David as being as constant and continual as day and night. We read in Jeremiah 33 verses 20 to 21. Thus saith the Lord, if you can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne. We read of God's overarching promises regarding the rulership of King David in 2 Samuel 7, starting in verses 8 to 9. Now therefore so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from, fo from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. God planned to preserve and replant the throne of David in a new location as we read in 2 Samuel 7 verse 10. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more, as before time. This was declared when Israel occupied the promised land, but God spoke of another appointed place where the people would dwell on their own and move no more. 
The appointed place would be the Britannic Isles, the covenant land. The word Britain is a Hebrew word that means covenant land, and British means covenant man. The kingdom of Israel under David became disunited after the death of Solomon and was regathered and reunited in the Isles as the United Kingdom of Great Britain. Concerning the house of David, the Davidic throne, we read further in 2 Samuel 7 verses 11 through to 16. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, that is referring to Solomon, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom for ever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established for ever before thee. Thy throne shall be established for ever. It is clear that this is an unconditional covenant, not relying on the obedience or integrity of the beneficiaries. God declared that he would punish such disobedience, but not take away his mercy from David and his descendants. These are known in scripture as the sure mercies of David. God's promise to establish the line of David's kingdom forever is mentioned three times in 2 Samuel 7. There can be no doubt that for the integrity of God's word to be upheld, the royal line of David must continue to this day, and there is overwhelming evidence that it does in the British throne. The royal standard of the United Kingdom of Great Britain comprises the heraldic symbols of the House of David. The harp of Ireland in the lower left quadrant represents the harp of David, his instrument of choice. The rampant line of Scotland in the upper right quadrant represents the line of the tribe of Judah, the lineal patriarch of David. The lions passant gardant in the other alternate quadrants represent England, the actual country from which the monarch of the United Kingdom reigns. Interestingly, when a British monarch passes away, all flags fly at half-mast, except the royal standard. Why? Because that standard represents the throne of David, which never ceases and continues forever. The royal coat of arms of the United Kingdom also contains clear symbols associated with the Bible, Israel and Judah. The two inscriptions represent the promises given to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Israel. At the base, Dieu et mon droit, God and my right, denotes the birthright obtained by Jacob, who was later renamed Israel by God. The buckler around the shield is inscribed with Oni soit qui mal y pense, evil to him who evil thinks of it which recites the promise given to Abraham and then passed on to Isaac and then Jacob. The shield with the insignia of the royal standard is supported by the lion and unicorn, as associated with the blessings given by God to Israel and recorded in Numbers 24 verses 8 to 9. The helmet and crown are surmounted by a small crowned lion at the very head, this represents Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who ultimately rules over all. In this instance, the letters E-R denote Elizabeth Regina, Queen Elizabeth II, her name in Hebrew meaning God is his oath. The graphic on the left is the inside page of the official programme for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II in 1953. 
it shows the flags of the more than 50 nations, territories and protectorates of the British Commonwealth of Nations, over which Queen Elizabeth reigned as constitutional head. On the right is the Queen photographed at the coronation with the royal regalia, including the St Edward's crown, the latter having 12 gemstones around the base, the very same stones as mounted on the breastplate of the Old Testament High Priest of Israel. There can be no doubt, regardless of man's belief or unbelief, God continues to keep his promises. Praise the Lord, very, very, uh, very in-depth summary, well put together, I think, by uh, Steve Gillespie, um, worth having a look again. You could spend another probably uh, half an hour, to be honest, looking at the, the various different symbolism on the, the coronation of the monarchy. Um, I, I'm just going to pick out two because... Otherwise, we'll be here forever. Um, so uh, you can see that um, one of the important things, is, and I'm not quite sure if it showed in the in the, when it showed you the video of the coronation, but there's a part that is called the anointing, and this is one of the most important parts of the service. The king's cloak or the queen's is removed and replaced by a white garment. The oil for the anointing is in a gold container in the shape of a dove, about seven inches, and a golden spoon is also used, both these items being part of the crown, crown jewels. And the archbishop reads the following prayer, O Lord, who by anointing with oil did of all make and consecrate kings, priests and prophets to teach and govern thy people Israel, bless and sanctify thy chosen servant, who by our office and ministry is now to be anointed with this oil and consecrated king of this realm. Strengthen him or her, O Lord, with the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. And, it, and it's just, uh, obviously, that would mean more to us because we've actually, you know, we are called kings and priests when we get the anointing. But again, you just see the symbolism and the connection, the fact that that's the very prayer that the Archbishop will uh, will quote, um, uh, you can see it in uh, when in First Kings in chapter one, verse thirty nine to forty, in the coronation of King Solomon, Zadok the priest took a horn of oil out of the tabernacle and anointed Solomon, and they blew the trumpet, and all the people said, "God save the King Solomon." We seen that in the in the video with Queen Elizabeth the second when she was coronated in uh, 1953 I think it was and how all the people shouted and came after came after after her and obviously back in the day in, uh, with Solomon and the people piped with pipes and rejoiced with great joy so that the earth rent with the sound of them and uh, one other thing maybe just is the fact that you can see in her hand I think in that particular photograph she's got the um the scepter, I think is that the rod maybe. And in the in the rod is the symbols of the royal authority of the church and state, which is very reminiscent of the quote in Isaiah that the government shall be upon his shoulders, talking about the Lord's upon the throne of David, upon his, his kingdom to establish it with just justice and judgment forever and ever. And we know it's it's interesting on the um the sector there's a, a world it got a, it's got a round uh, uh orb i think it is and over it is a cross and it's just just to, to show that regardless who's got the crown 
that Jesus Christ is the ultimate king and he's the ultimate one that rules and reigns. Uh, you could, as I said, you could spend another 20 minutes or 40 minutes going through all the various different symbolism. But I suppose, the, you know, we, we looked a lot of times when we look at this from the fellowship, maybe being biased, it always tends to be from the English side of things. So hence the reason the last few weeks I wanted to look at the, the Irish side of things because, you know, I was saying to someone today, come growing up in Ireland in the culture. And before I came to the Lord, I was very Republican personally in my views. I didn't know anything about the throne of David, didn't know anything about Irish history and how uh, how the, the, the Zara line and the Faraz line met in the land of Ireland and healed the breach that had happened when the twins originally uh, were born. You, you don't have to be a genius to, to look at the uh, heraldry in particular in Ulster. It's, it's dominated by the red hand. And the most prominent uh, people in Irish folklore from Ulster have the, the red branch, which is Cú Cullen in, in, in myth and his, his, uh, his, his army. And then the other one is the O'Neills and their whole family crest is the red hand. All coming back to that particular story in the uh, Old Testament. And of course, growing up in Dublin, coming from the province of Leinster is the harp. Is, that's our symbol is, is when, when Leinster playing the rugby you see that the harp is their emblem. So all over Ireland, once the Lord starts opening up your eyes and you take away your cultural bias and how you can be sometimes blinded by a small piece of history of 800 years on when Ireland was ruled by uh, uh, England, that that can sometimes blind you to the overall big picture. And it is, it is something that we can bring to people that, you know, it's it's such an interesting story. And next year, or whenever the coronation of Charles happens, it's absolutely amazing how many people will watch it. Or the fact when the Queen died recently, even if you're not pro-monarchy or anything like that, uh, it's it's just the whole world is engrossed in it. And I find that amazing because that's where Jesus Christ, that's the throne he will take up. That's the throne he's going to rule uh, Israel, not just biblical Israel, uh, but also uh, the Gentiles, etc. And everybody will have to come to that throne. So it's uh, it's it's an amazing story when you look back at the, the various different prophecies from the healing of the Zara and the Pharaohs to the fact the Lord would overturn it three times to the fact that the stone would move from as well from the Middle East over into the British Isles, still part of that whole ceremony. And that whole ceremony from the Old Testament is still alive today and will be alive until Jesus Christ returns. So yeah, praise the Lord for uh, the fact that he keeps his promises and not just, to, not just on the big stuff, but he keeps them to me and you, as we know, by being spiritual. So hallelujah, we'll leave it there. Amen.